So I, I started out in climate change, possibly like other people, my main passion uh, after leaving university was, was environmental protection and biodiversity and habitats protection and species conservation. And I think it was a sort of around about the sort of mid-90s when I realised that all the work I'd been doing to try and conserve species and habitats was about to be hit by this massive tidal wave of a problem, which was global climate change. And it was quite <coughs> soon after that that I tried to shift from the work I'd been doing on legal protection for species and, and habitats to working on climate change. And I was fortunate enough to be employed by Friends of the Earth um, as their UK climate change campaigner. So that was my very first job that was spe specifically looking at, at climate change. And uh, after joining, um, I started to get very interested in the data. So I'm a little bit of a data geek, I'm afraid. I like spreadsheets and numbers, and I, I feel safe knowing you know, the numbers tell you something and, and, and you can rely on them, hopefully. Um, so I looked at what was going on in the UK's emissions history of, of, its, of its record. And I, I realised that although we had, we'd been doing reasonably well in reducing our emissions, it had nothing to do with government policy. It was almost an accident. And it was largely down to the shift to gas. Um, we discovered North Sea gas, we exploited it, and we built a lot of gas-fired power stations. And those replaced pretty filthy old coal-fired power stations. And we had a double benefit. So not only is gas a much cleaner fuel, but the stations themselves were newer and more efficient. So the government was very happy telling everyone, we've got climate change licked, you know, we're doing really well. But actually, it was an accident of economic policy that had nothing to do with the environment, really. Um, and so what then happened was, in 97, uh, we had a Labour government come into power. And their view of the world was slightly different to the preceding government. And they actually brought in a moratorium on the building of gas-fired power stations because they could see what was happening, which was essentially our coal base was being uh, destroyed, our miners were being put out of work, and our power stations were shutting down. So they stopped the building of gas, and pretty much things st just stood still for a while. And what then happened was emissions started bouncing around a bit. So global commodity prices started shifting, and you would see that um, if coal was particularly cheap and gas was very expensive, you'd see these sudden spikes in our emissions when everyone switched back to coal. Those power stations that had been there since the 60s were turned back on, repowered, and started producing electricity again. And this meant that really, as a country, we had no real control over our emissions. Uh, we like to think we had this very sophisticated handle on mitigation of climate change, but actually, we were really at the mercy of global commodity prices. And I, and I felt that this was something that needed to be addressed if we were going to really seriously track down our emissions steadily over you know, several decades. We needed levers and tools that would enable us to control these forces, these, these uncontrollable uh, economic uh, impacts. So I, and I, it was also slightly coloured by my background, which had been I'd been working on a campaign for new laws for, for biodiversity, and I felt that a legal solution for climate change was needed. Um, the government's policy at the time was uh, to have policy documents each every five years. They would produce a lovely looking document, very nicely produced, very well written, very well meaning, but actually full of tiny, tiny little policies. Uh, you know, a little bit of energy efficiency here, possibly a bit of support for renewables over here, but no comprehensive view of what are the big drivers in the economy, how do we get a handle on making these uh, go in the right direction. So we had two of these lovely looking climate change programs which did nothing really to actually drive emissions down. And we at Friends of the Earth wrote a submission um, in the review for the, before the third one to say, look guys, you're going to have to start, stop doing this, start a new approach, because this bottom up kind of tinkering with bits of policy is not delivering. And so we wrote a document which called for the introduction of carbon budgets, which is not a, a new idea. Um, anyone who knows how the Kyoto Protocol works knows that that sets the world carbon budgets. It says this is the amount we should be emitting as developed countries. And over this five-year period, you developed countries have to stay within that carbon budget. You can trade, but you know there's a limit on how much you can emit. And so we thought, well, let's just take that idea and make it a national policy. So we will, we will create a legal framework where the UK government is not just facing one five-year budget created by the UN, but a succession of five-year budgets 
leading out all the way to 2050 so that you have a, 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 cur a, a line of emissions that's known in advance that is reducing over that period of time and everyone will that, that will be a legal a legally binding commitment so that was the that was friends of the earth suggestion and uh, you know as with anything when you're an ngo and you're on the outside and you're lobbying you kind of hope that you're going to have an impact but you're never really very sure so uh, we sent this document off and we had some signs that, that it was being well received. Elliot Morley, who was the environment minister at the time, invited us in and he was very, you know, he's a lovely man and very kind and said, this, this, is, this is the sort of thing we should be doing. But he never really thought he'd actually have the power to do it. But then something changed. So we then had a newly elected leader of the opposition. So David Cameron came in and wanted to reinvent the Conservative Party. And he decided to take an environmental theme. He changed the logo to a tree, and he, he'd obviously listened to the focus groups, and he realised that the environment actually was an, a, an issue for the electorate. So he um, was lobbied by Friends of the Earth, and he said, yeah, I'll deliver you a climate change act. If, I, if you vote me in, I will, I will give you the bill that you want that will bring in this legal framework. Um, and that was hugely important. Um, that Friends of the Earth campaign that, enabled, that got the opposition to take up this policy was really important. And at the same time, um, David Miliband had just been made Secretary of State for um, Department of Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, I think it was then, so the, the bit of government that did climate change. And he was also you know, a young, very powerful, dynamic character, and he wanted to make his mark. And I think initially he was quite sceptical about needing legislation, but there was David Cameron saying he would deliver a bill. So very quickly, um, that it became government policy that they would also deliver a bill. So already you can see that this process of change was dependent on quite, in, you know, things that you could not have predicted, that you needed certain characters in certain positions to really take this agenda forward. And, uh, you know, the degree of luck really involved was quite, it was, you know, quite astounding. And it did come down to these personalities, these big people who wanted to make a difference. So um, by the time David Miliband had joined um, DEFRA, I had left Friends of the Earth, having set up the campaign, spent some time in a power company and learning how things work there, which is very interesting. And they had then seconded me into DEFRA. So when David Miliband arrived and said, right, it looks like we're going to have to have a climate change bill, who do we know in the department who can help us with this? Someone said, well, Bryony wrote the document at Friends of the Earth that kicked this whole thing off. Why don't we get her in and see if she can help? So I got shifted off my... I was doing some work on public awareness and, and um, a, a campaign about educating people about climate change and told, right, you're going to be part of a team of civil servants. We want you to draft a bill. And, I mean, it was quite a, quite a challenge. I mean, we were a team of maybe, I think it was eight of us working full-time, um, tasked with preparing a draft bill, and not just a fairly large bill, but also quite a short period of time. David Miliband was convinced he was going to be reshuffled off to another department, so he wanted action fast. So he said, I want this bill in three months. So the lawyers all said, oh, no, no, you can't get a bill done in three months. It'll take six or maybe a year. And we said, well, we've only got three months, so let's try it. And that speed was actually another key factor that, looking back on it, was really important. Because one thing that Whitehall's very good at doing is producing huge amounts of documents and papers and concepts and notes. And, but if you're moving fast, um, often, if you bombard people with huge amounts of information, they will usually find a couple of things that they object to, and, they'll, and you then have to have a process of negotiation on those one or two issues, as opposed to the minutiae of every single clause, every single policy. So we were fortunate in a way that because um, let's not pretend that the government was united in wanting this. Um, the Department of Environment was very in favour, DFID was in favour, the FCO was pretty much in favour, but certainly the Treasury thought this was a terrible idea, and the Department of uh, Business thought it was a terrible idea, and largely because they felt the UK acting alone would be really detrimental to our competitiveness. Here we were proposing a self-imposed target that was going to last to 2050, and it would introduce costs and force businesses to move overseas and all sorts. The world was going to end, according to the Treasury. Um, and we kept saying, well, you know, we don't think that's true. This is all very moderate. It's very manageable. Um, and it's important because we've got to show leadership. And it was, it was so we ended up arguing with the Treasury 
more on a principle than on the detail because we were moving so fast that they only had maybe one or two policy people covering our brief, whereas we had you know, a team of lawyers and us and all our special advisors. And we basically just were able to you know, outwit them a little bit by moving quickly. So that was another element that I think l led to, the, to it being successful. And f the sort of draft bill came out um, with with, I think, elements in it that were true to the Friends of the Earth concept. Friends of the Earth always wanted it to be you know, more ambitious or slightly different in its format, but it had the basic premise there, which there was a legally binding cap that would make the whole government responsible for delivering re emissions reductions. It had adaptation clauses in there. It had enabling powers that meant that in the future, if government wanted to introduce policies to constrain emissions, they could do so easily. And importantly, it created an independent body called the, Cl the Committee on Climate Change, who would advise the government on how these budgets should be set and met over the, over the time. And those elements, those sort of key elements, are what, what are now in the bill today. And it's, I, I mean, I think, where are we now? So it's 2011, it was finally signed off by, by Parliament in 2008. And has it made a difference? Well, I think the major difference it's, it's achieved is that it's made government take this issue more seriously. I don't think it's um, necessarily driving down emissions exactly in the way that we wanted it to, but every department now has a responsibility towards meeting the requirements of this bill. There is an independent body, the, the Committee on Climate Change, who are able to talk to the media and create you know, a sense of pressure on government to do the right thing. And we will know um, in the next few months the fourth carbon budget is going to be set. Now, the proposals from the committee are quite impressive, they're quite tight, they're quite challenging, and we're going to be seeing now how government's going to respond when that goes through the parliament in terms of will government stay true to its ideas of being a green government and back a tight fourth carbon budget. That's, so we'll, we'll see what happens in the next few months. So, and I, actually, I should say that my role since doing all of this, I've just been made a, uh, a baroness, so I'm in the House of Lords. And so my role, having been involved in this thing quite a number of different ways. Uh, my final role will be seeing how it goes through in the Lords and hoping, I'm hoping to be able to use my position to make sure it's as tight as it possibly can be. <laughs>